this hearing to order. For the record, my name is Kendra Lara, <laughs> District 6 City Councilor. I am standing in at the request of Councilor Julia Mejia, who is the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Labor, Workforce, and Economic Development. I'm joined this morning by my colleague, City Council President Ed Flynn from District 2. This hearing is being recorded and it's being live streamed on boston.gov slash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. Today's hearing is on docket number 0618, a resolution calling for an end to the U.S. embargo against Cuba and reopening new travel and collaborative cultural, medical, and academic opportunities between the two countries. This matter was sponsored by my office and referred to the Committee on Labor, Workforce, and Economic Development on May 11, 2022. We will be taking public testimony after the panel presents. For all testimony, please state your name, neighborhood, or affiliation, and try to keep your comments to two minutes. If you are with us here in the chamber, please sign up on the sheet near the chamber entrance. And if you're interested in testifying virtually, please email Shane, S-H-A-N-E dot PAC, P-A-C, at boston.gov for the link. Um, before turning the floor to our panelists, I'd like to acknowledge um, Council President Flynn for any opening remarks. President Flynn, you have the floor. Have any, I don't have any opening remarks. Just want to say thank you to you um, for your important work on this issue and the panelists for being here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I first want to thank all of you for your solidarity and your exchange with the Cuban people, and especially to my constituents, the churches and organizations in District 6 who called on me to move this resolution forward. This is one of the longest standing and most aggressive embargoes in our history and has created a humanitarian crisis that has cost many human lives. Uh, it's unorthodox that a Boston City Council uh, committee hold a hearing on a resolution, but I thought that I would be remiss if I let this learning opportunity pass us. Boston has much to benefit from open medical, environmental, and public health exchanges with Cuba. And as a black internationalist, I believe that I have a responsibility for being in solidarity with oppressed people globally. And I hope to use whatever power, resource, and influence I have to do so. And I think that holding this hearing is a part of that. Um, I'm now gonna turn the floor to our panelists. We are going to begin with the two panelists who are joining us virtually. We are joined by Eloisa Galvao from the Brazilian Women's Group equity now and beyond, and Sandy Eaton, um, who is a registered nurse and health justice for Boston. And they are with us on Zoom. Have them up. Hello, should I start? Give me one second, we can't see you. We're having some technical issues. We, um, can you ask if you can do a very brief recess? Beautiful. We're going to take a brief uh, recess to get some technical difficulties squared away. Give us one second, um, Eloisa and Sandy. Thank you. Kendra, could you?
Thanks. Hello. No. Alex, my charger for my computer is in my bag. Can you bring it for me? In the office. It's in my bag on my desk. Hi, Eloisa? Yes. Beautiful. We're just checking if we can hear you. Sandy, can you also speak so we can make sure we can hear you? Oh, can you hear me now? Sandy Eaton. Beautiful. Okay. We're just trying to make sure that we can see you here in the chambers. There we go. Thank you. Beautiful. That's good for me. We're going to start now. We were getting this TV up. <laughs> okay, we can see you now here. So we're going to get started and come back from recess in a brief minute.
panelists on Zoom. So our two panelists that are here virtual are Eloisa Galvao from the Brazilian Women's Group and Equity Now and Beyond, and Sandy Eaton, um, Health Justice for Boston. Eloisa Galvao, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you for having me here. My name is Eloisa Galvão, and I am the co-founder and the executive director of the Brazilian Women's Group, a 27 years old community organization based in Brighton, but we work with the whole state. The Brazilian Women's Group mission is to empower women and some men to become financially independent and speak up for themselves to advocate for their rights. Briefly about myself, I am Brazilian. I have lived in Boston for 34 years. I am a graduate from Boston University with two master's degree, and I, I am a proud resident of Jamaica Plan. As a community, we have come a long way. Brazilians started to immigrate to Boston in large numbers in the mid-late 80s, established themselves mainly in Boston, Somerville, and Framingham. Housing costs have taken a toll in our community and people are moving towards far away from the, the cities. But it is in Boston that they shop, that they work, and that they look for entertainment. We are the largest and most organized Brazilian community in the US with several organizations led by Brazilian women and we have five Brazilians elected to positions, the state house, city councils, and school committees. Since the pandemic started, we, um, we haven't closed our doors and we re realized that our members needed financial support, but also help information. We joined um, Equity Now and Beyond, and together we have organized about 30 vaccination clinics in the greater Boston area, and we have vaccinated about 2,000 people from five years old on. Um, my sister, I want to share with you an experience. My sister is a pediatrician in Brazil, and she worked with Cuban doctors in health clinics around the city of Rio de Janeiro. Many times she mentioned to me how helpful they were and how happy she was, what a difference they made working side to side with Brazilian doctors in poor neighborhoods. Can we guess um, how rich it would be to have the same experience here in Boston and in Massachusetts? The Brazilian Women's Group and myself personally support an end to the Cuban blockade it's totally nonsense, a political decision that has harmed our eyes and should end. I appreciate the Boston Council, um, City Council take on this issue, and I think that we all would benefit from a resolution on then this blockade. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Galvao. Sandy Eaton, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to the committee uh, and to the whole city council for this opportunity. And I'm particularly personally grateful for coming uh, early in the, in the program because uh, well, I have a medical appointment at my community health center uh, early this afternoon and I'm very glad to uh, uh, be taken early. Um, I'm a retired critical care nurse and uh, I'm a patient, as I mentioned, in a, a fine community health center. Um, my first taste of working in healthcare was at the old Boston City Hospital for fourth floor pavilion building back in 1963. So I've been kicking around healthcare uh, for a while. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of uh, um, uh, facts and figures and insights uh, during the course of today, I trust. Uh, but let me just uh, bring this, uh, uh, my remarks uh, into focus by saying it's, it's around enlightened self-interest. Um, we in the US need at least as much need this uh, ending of the embargo and opening up of relationships even more than the Cuban people. Um, in, in various arenas of healthcare, uh, public health, healthcare delivery, and environmental justice, 
Um, we have much, much to learn, and uh, we are in dire need of fundamental uh, reform in all areas. In, um, in public health, the experience of, of, the, of the Cuban people, especially during the pandemic, has shown. And it's uh, medical brigades helping folks, particularly around the global south, uh, is, is an inspiration. Um, healthcare uh, there is, uh, is a social good and not uh, a, a vehicle for individual or corporate ag aggrandizement. It's, it's people, not profit, is the motive. And that's what some of us in this country have been fighting hard. Many of us in this country have been fighting hard for, for a long, long time. And certainly uh, uh, environmental justice is impossible in a militarized uh, world with military blocks. And I, I'll just personally add a footnote that the uh, uh, longstanding uh, U.S. occupation of, uh, of territory uh, on the island of, uh, of Cuba should, should be ended. There's no need for it, especially for the uh, 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 egregious uses it's been, uh, Guantanamo has been put to. Um, uh, health justice for Boston, or Salud Conus DC, a part of Boston, um, uh, has been around since uh, January of 2014. Um, uh, we've uh, done newsletters uh, to try to inform people, and we're currently more active on social media. But the, I also uh, represent uh, the uh, Fund Healthcare Not Warfare Working Group of Massachusetts Peace Action. And, uh, we, uh, and I'm there collaborating as a representative of MassCare, the Massachusetts Campaign for Single Payer Healthcare. So let me see that we in this country need to put our healthcare system on a, on a sharply different basis. Marketplace medicine <clears throat> uh, and its priorities uh, shuts down uh, facilities and services where they're most needed if they're not profitable enough for somebody. Um, I, I just want to uh, say that um, we've got a long way to go. Uh, I'm very glad that we're taking this step in Boston. You know, folks like us uh, across the country are, are finding their way forward to speak out uh, to end this militarized uh, ending right now, the 62-year-old illegal uh, uh, blockade uh, of uh, Cuba. We need uh, dialogue. Uh, we need sharing uh, vaccines and we need uh, sharing of lessons on how to treat each other and live together in, in peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Eaton. I'd like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by City Councilor um, Tanya Fernandez-Anderson from District 7. Councilor Anderson, do you have any opening remarks that you would like to share? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I probably prefer listening a bit. I uh, apologize for my tardiness. Beautiful, thank you so much. Thank you to our virtual panelists. We are now going to move to the panelists who are here in person with us. We are joined by Catherine DeLore, beautiful, and shortly with us, um, Pastor Duford Kiki Florissant. Um, Catherine, you now have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Catherine DeLore from Mission Hill. And I'm very pleased to see that the Boston City Council is taking on this very important action. I'm here representing myself as well as Women's Health Institute, as well as the more than 1,000 members of the Massachusetts Peace Action Organization that is all in favor of lifting the embargo on uh, Cuba. Many people think that if we lift the embargo on Cuba, it will be for the benefit or the greater benefit for Cuba itself, but that from the public health perspective, that is not exactly true. In the United States, we can see how the um, public health factor and the public health system has failed us or the system has failed the public health system because we have not had the resources in public health to carry out those actions that we can do. Right now, within the United States, only 2.5% of the health budget goes to public health. Just think of all the rest of the money that goes to acute care and non-preventive actions. One of the reasons that health care in Cuba can surpass the United States in many of its aspects is that Cuba has a wonderful uh, integrated healthcare system in which they integrate both the 
both the preventive as well as the clinical aspect. And we have to ask ourselves why, if Cuba only spends half as much per person on their healthcare system, why do we have exactly the same years of life expectancy? Life expectancy in the United States is 78 years. It is the same for those in Cuba. We spend, in the United States, we spend $12,500 for each and every single person for health care. In Cuba, they spend $5,000. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that happening? Cuba has enshrined their whole health care system within their constitution so that they focus on public health and prevention. And a number of other ways that we can look at how that has been uh, manifested is to look at the infant mortality rate. Those of us in public health, if we could have no one other statistic to look at to decide how the health care system is functioning, we would look at the infant death rate. The reason for that is it tells us a little bit about the health care of the mother over her life. It tells us what kind of prenatal care she had and what kind of health care they had when they were um, in the process of delivering. Within the United States, we have 5.6 infant deaths per 1,000 births. In Cuba, that is 3.8. That is in the United States, it is 47% greater death rate. A recent manifestation of the impact of the blockade on the difference between the United States and Cuba has to do with our uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic. With the pandemic, we were not allowed, the United States was not allowed to share any information about our vaccines, the processes with it, and so forth. So therefore, Cuba had to go and develop its own vaccine for COVID. Their Soberdana was wonderfully developed. They have manifested, again, much greater positive aspects towards the COVID pandemic than we have in the United States. In, the, in Cuba, they have had only 75 cases per 100,000 compared to 305 cases per 100,000 people. Of the people who are vaccinated in Cuba, it's 88%. In the United States, we're only down to 67%. And the most startling statistic relating to the pandemic has to do with the death rate for COVID and the pandemic. In Cuba, it is approximately one person, one death rate, one de person who has died from COVID for every 100,000 people in the country. In the United States, it's 32. So we can see where we have not um, lived up to our reputation as being the best healthcare system in the world. And when we lift the blockade, the exchanges of information in the United States, what we can do, what we started to do during the Obama era when they lifted some of the blockade, blockade was to share information. And so lifting the blockade means that we can learn more about how we can get a better health care system, a public health care system, and an equitable health care system using more resources. So on behalf of all the organizations that I mentioned, I firmly expect that the city council would please vote for lifting the blockade on Cuba. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Delory. Um, I am going to go to questions from the council for any of the three panelists at this moment. Uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. I actually don't have any questions. I encourage and applaud you for being here. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Catherine DeLore. Ms. DeLore, uh, thank you so much and welcome for being here. Um, thank you. And my many thanks to Councilor Lara for filing this and for holding this hearing um, on such an important, as a, such an important issue. Um, as an African woman, I deeply, I have deep respect for Cuba for all of their um, influence and work that they've had to, uh, they, they put in with the guerrilla militia 
in West Africa, in Ghana, and also with Amilcar Cabral to liberate uh, Cape Verde, uh, leading to our independence um, and meant much more. Cuba is actually the only country that actually provides scholarships to um, medical students in Cuba. Then they would, I think they work for a couple of years and then they, have to, they can return to Cape Verde. So Cuba is the reason why uh, we have uh, doctors in Cape Verde Islands in West Africa. Um, and much more, the list goes on and on. Um, I'm, I have deep respect, I encourage and support this uh, filing and Thank look you. forward to learning more. And if I have any other questions, I guess in the second round I can ask them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Um, I think it goes without saying that Cuba has stood in solidarity with so many members of the international community um, when other folks haven't, and that um, their public health infrastructure, their um, their values and their principles to put people before profit have really been a benefit, um, not only to the Cuban people, but to other um, countries across the world. So I am happy that we're really having this conversation here today. Um, one of the questions that I have, and this will be for any of the panelists, can any of you talk, I think we've talked about the impact that the blockade and the embargo have had on Cuba during the COVID-19 pandemic, but they've really um, been able to make strides in public health before and during the pandemic in spite of it. So can any of you share a little more about what those successes have looked like? And how we can benefit from some of that here in the city of Boston? Well, I, with Sandy's permission, I could uh, start with that in that um, they have organized everything around a prevention and public information aspect. They've completely decentralized their healthcare system so that there are neighborhood clinics in basically every neighborhood in which they have a physician and a nurse. And as a nurse myself, I'm really pleased to see that they place the nurse as at the same level as the physician, that they are working in absolute partnership. They educate the individuals. They, for those who have chronic issues, chronic healthcare issues, they go to their homes and visit them. And they also, long before the United States started, in the United States, we started to recognize the social determinants of health. That is the aspects of our own environment that influence our health. Cuba had already recognized that and were educating people in their homes and in their communities of ways that they could do to um, influence their health in a positive way. So I would say that the um, most important aspect is decentralizing their healthcare system, looking at prevention and public health issues to work at health. Um, that's not to deny that they lack some, Cuba lacks some of the resources that we have in the United States, but we have to look at how those resources really influence health when you look at the data, the demographic data of healthcare that exists in Cuba versus ours. And so, as I said earlier in my testimony or my comments, I said that we get, uh, we pay twice per person and we get the same, uh, life expectancy that they do in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Mr. Eaton, do you um, also want to share um, an answer to that question? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll jump in. I'm very grateful to Dr. Delory for uh, uh, setting the stage for giving that background. Uh, I just want to point out that one of the things that we've been doing in, in Massachusetts is uh, opening up dialogue between uh, researchers, scientists, medical personnel in Cuba and in the United States. Uh, and, and elsewhere around the world, but particularly Cuba is, is, a, is a shining example, um, thanks to the Massachusetts Peace Action uh, uh, and uh, uh, some of the folks there, we've been able to facilitate that. I think so that's one contribution, small contribution we've been able to make, and we certainly hope to break down all the barriers, open it up, uh, you know, uh, for a full-fledged uh, sharing uh, uh, and cooperation. Uh, we've got a global uh, uh, crisis on our hands. Uh, we need a global solution, and we're making a, a, a significant but small step in that direction by passing this resolution, and thank you for taking it up, and by building a movement in this country that is going to influence the Biden administration and, uh, and, uh, and, and open things up and get back on, uh, to normalize uh, relations. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Ali. And if I may, I would like to add about the health workers experience that Cuba has. Uh, we had the same. We have the same experience in Brazil. We have people who go to uh, your house and knock at the door and check on people. That's how we dealt with dengue. Um, but since we, you know, since the current president of Brazil was elected in 2018, um, this has been, he works for the, the virus. He doesn't work to prevent the spread of the virus. So it, it was a bad moment. It, it, it has been a bad moment for us. But I just want to point out how much we could learn if we have health workers and doctors from Cuba here teaching us, showing us how they work the neighborhood, what we don't do in the United States. We're very individualist. We take care of ourselves, but we have to look at their experience, taking you know, these people to the community. They become friends with families. Families know them, and, and they trust them. They get the information, they get the service. I think it, we just have to benefit from this. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Galvao. Uh, we have now been joined by Pastor Duford Florissant, or Pastor Kiki, how he is known in the community. Uh, I have been told, Pastor, that it is your birthday today. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you so much for taking time during your birthday to come and spend with us today. Um, you now have the floor, and you have about five minutes for your presentation. Thank you so very much, Madam Chair, and thank you all the city councilors, uh, advocates uh, for this uh, uh, important uh, uh, resolution. I am so blessed. This is the right thing to do. James 417, whoever knows the right thing to do and yet failed to do it, this is what we call sin. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful just uh, to be here to offer my testimony on behalf of this uh, uh, very important resolution. Uh, Pastor Jufo Florissant, I'm a member of the Equity Now and Beyond uh, Chihuahuan Center, Haitian American United, and many other uh, organizations and Greater Boston Interfit all as well. Um, after Hurricane George, to give you a little background on uh, how Cuba has been uh, a great supporter, uh, ally uh, to uh, Haiti, the Haitian Cuban Corporation Agreement committed Cuba to maintain 300 to 500 healthcare professionals in Haiti mm -hmm. and to train in Haitian physicians to gradually, uh, that could gradually replace them. So Cuban doctors went to poorest area in Haiti where needed most and where medical support was scarce in city and rural areas. I remember in 2002, I visited uh, uh, the southern part of Haiti called Lekai, and I saw Haitian, I mean, Cuban doctors going into elderly home. Those elderly would never have access to a physician if it wasn't for the, uh, the assistance of those uh, Cuban doctors. By 2004, 579 Cubans had attended 75% of Haitian population, where Cubans were stationed, infant mortality dropped uh, from 80 to 33 live births from 1998 to 2003. By 2007, one million vaccines by Cubans and two ophthalmology centers had been set up in Haiti as part of the operation called Milagro. As numbers of Haitian medical students at the Escuela Latino Americana de Medicina uh, grew. Uh, a second facility was opened again in Santiago de Cuba to train them along French speaking West African students. By 2011, 625 Haitians had graduated as doctors in Cuba, and 430 were looking in Haiti, mostly in the public health uh, care sector. 2010 earthquake has been the paramount of the uh, uh, magnitude of the support of, uh, from Cuba to Haiti. Cuba already had 344 medical personnel in Haiti, alongside hundreds of Haitian physicians trained in Cuba. When the earthquake hit, Cuba sent 748 additional healthcare professionals, along with 481 Haitians grad uh, from the school and 278 grads also from other countries. Then, Again, 2010 cholera outbreak, again from UN peacekeepers in Haiti. Cubans set up cholera treatment centers and oral rehydration posts and set up tents 
by 10 exams and public health campaign in Haitian Creole. In 2012, again, Haitian officials revealed that since late 1998, Cuban healthcare workers in Haiti had performed 331,000 surgeries, attended 141,000 births, and saved over 312,000 lives. Over 60,000 Haitians had their eyesight restored via Operation Milagro, and 878 Haitians had graduated as physicians from Cuba. Cubans were working in almost 100 healthcare facilities in Haiti. As we know, our motto is, in God we trust. As God's children, we must reflect the qualities of God's character, his righteousness, which is peace, justice, and love, both within and outside the covenant community. I stand right there. If you have any other questions, we are more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, um, Pastor Florissant. We are going to move to public testimony, and then we'll go to a second round of questions um, from my council colleagues. We are going to start our testimony with um, the folks who are with us on Zoom, virtual public testimony. Um, is U.S. Representative Jim McGovern with us? Great. We're going to get started, and then we'll move through. Dr. Elizabeth Summers. Molly Morley. Yes, I am here. Sorry for that technical delay. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Elizabeth Summers, this is you? Yes, it is. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. You now have the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm an assistant professor in family medicine at Boston University School of Medicine as well as senior acupuncturist and researcher in Boston Medical Center's uh, Integrative Medicine and Health Disparities Program. I'm speaking on behalf of um, lifting the blockade and embargo, and my comments are my own, not those of my institutional affiliation. I first became involved with Cuba when I started bringing medications for HIV to the island uh, about 20 some years ago. And although that exchange was me bringing something there, um, ultimately I learned so much about what Cuban medicine and public health were contributing to the world. And there are three of those items that I'm going to just briefly mention. Um, the organizational ideas that Dr. Delore outlined from, uh, so the health model, the, the, the way that, that the whole system is set up from the neighborhood to the polyclinics to um, inc be inclusive and to ensure health healthcare for all. This is something we can definitely learn in this country. Also the integration of biomedicine and in integrative approaches like acupuncture, like herbal medicine, like massage and physical therapy. Cuba is way ahead of where we are in this country and we could learn so much from them. And then lastly, the area of vaccines, not only COVID, but also other medications that are very effective to deal with various types of cancer. We have a lot to learn. I feel that from an area of mutual exchange that lifting the embargo would be very important as well as for addressing social justice issues. Um, I don't feel the embargo is moral. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Summers. Next up, we have Molly Morley. Is Molly Morley with us? Yes, I'm here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, absolutely. Ms. Morley, you have the floor. Great, thank you. So my name is Molly Morley, and I'm a constituent living in Dorchester. And I wanted to take the time to give testimony today as a resident of Boston on how removing the embargo will benefit the Boston City Council's residents. So this embargo has been in place for decades and achieved very little to protect US national security interests. Boston, as you all know, is home to world-class academic and biotech institutions while Cuba is known for its medical achievements, as many of the panelists have previously highlighted. 
Collaboration between Boston's medical community and Cuba will only enhance Boston's reputation as an international biotech hub by providing access to cutting edge research from Cuba. This knowledge sharing will promote greater innovation and biotech developments in Boston, benefiting the city's residents, academic institutions, and businesses, and further improving the city's global standing. But aside from these medical benefits, what I would really love to see from the Boston City Council is for it to learn from Cuba on its approach to environmental mitigation. Cuba is an international leader in sustainable development due to its uniquely significant risk of climate impacts. As Boston increasingly faces similar impacts from climate change, the city could learn from Cuba's successful mitigation strategies and develop a similarly comprehensive adaptation plan. Addressing the climate crisis requires re-examining long-standing power structures like this embargo and reorienting our approach towards collaboration and cooperation. As a resident of Boston, I would love to see the city be a national leader in this growing movement to end the unnecessary embargo. It's clear the embargo has failed and it serves no national objective. More specifically, maintaining this tired Cold War mentality unnecessarily hurts the interests of Boston residents and businesses. I strongly encourage the city council to support the resolution and end the embargo on Cuba. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Morley. Next up, we have um, A.V. Chomsky. Is A.V. Chomsky with us? Yes, I am. <clears throat> A.V., it is a pleasure to meet you in person, um, or to see you on Zoom, at least. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Um, so I am a professor of Latin American history and coordinator of Latin American studies at Salem State University in Salem. And um, Cuba, uh, Cuban history is one of my main areas of teaching and research interests. I've published two books on Cuban history, A History of the Cuban Revolution and The Cuba Reader, History, Culture, Politics. Um, I teach a course on the history of the Cuban Revolution and frequently since 1996 have traveled with students to Cuba. Um, Every other year, more or less, I teach my um, History of the Cuban Revolution course, and it includes a 10-day uh, travel experience in Cuba, um, either during the summer or during our spring break. Um, so I come at this from an academic standpoint, and especially from the perspective of student exchange and educational exchange. Uh, practically every time I have organized my student trip to Cuba, the rules of the US embargo have changed, making it more or less difficult, depending on um, which administration is in power and where the wind, which way the electoral winds in Congress are uh, blowing. Um, making it difficult in different ways and hoops that we need to jump through to uh, carry out this educational exchange. Obviously, Boston is an academic center. Um, we have strong connections with Latin America. And truthfully, the US embargo or blockade of Cuba is an academic embarrassment. Um, it makes it difficult for those of us who study Latin America to do our research. It makes it difficult for students to learn about Latin America. Um, and it makes it difficult for us to collaborate with other countries in Latin America because no Latin American country appreciates US bullying and intervention. And unfortunately, the United States has a long history of bullying and intervention in Latin America. Uh, for other Latin Americans, Cuba is a sovereign country. Uh, Cubans have the right to determine their own form of government, and the best way that we can support the Cuban people is through people-to-people -people exchanges and supporting Cubans' right to their sovereignty, um, independence, and ability to make the changes in their society that they want to make from their perspective without the bullying of their large and um, unfortunately interventionist northern neighbor. So I speak to this from and act, from the standpoint of an academic, but also from a moral standpoint, that um, we do not appreciate other countries interfering in our elections, and we should not be interfering in the politics of um, our Latin American neighbors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Avi Chomsky. I really appreciate it. So we're going to go back. We have um, Representative Jim McGovern with us here. 
Hey, uh, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. Right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, and I want to let me thank Chair Mejia and, uh, and members of the committee for holding this important hearing uh, on Resolution 618, which calls for an end to the U.S. embargo against Cuba and the opening up of uh, new travel collabor and collaborative culture, medical and academic opportunities between our two countries. Uh, so my name is Jim McGovern, uh, and it's an honor to speak with you today. I represent the second congressional district of Massachusetts uh, in the United States Congress. Um, and I currently serve as the chairman of the House Rules Committee. I also co-chaired two congressional commissions who job, whose job it is to promote global human rights and the rule of law, the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and the Congressional Executive Commission on China. So my, uh, my career in public service has largely focused on advocating for and advancing the human rights of all people, both here in the United States, uh, where I call attention to our own human rights issues, as well as abroad, by ensuring that our government's foreign policy serves as a beacon to the world by living up to the values that we profess and putting human rights concerns first. My first visit to Cuba was in 1979 when I was a college student at American University. I continued to visit Cuba in the 1980s when I was an aide to Congressman Joe Moakley of South Boston. And when I got elected to Congress in 1996, my visits to the island continued. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, bec as, you know and, and I became a, a vocal advocate for normalizing relations between our two countries. And why? Uh, simply put, because U.S. policy towards Cuba is misguided, self-defeating, and stupid. Um, and let me just give you three reasons why I believe that to be the case. First, the embargo and the regulations to carry it out disproportionately harm the people of Cuba. They add to the suffering of ordinary Cuban families, empower hardliners who want to vilify America, and do nothing to offer hope or opportunity to ordinary Cubans. For example, current regulations prevent Cuban Americans from sending money to their loved ones on the island closing Western Union operations in 2020 and adding to the economic hardships facing Cuban families. And there's the issue of food and medical aid. Current regulations uh, to enforce the embargo make it nearly impossible for many companies or even nonprofits to get food and medical supplies to the island, including during the COVID pandemic. Second, our embargo is self-defeating and hurts the United States too. Rather than strengthening American leadership in our own hemisphere and expanding our influence in the region, U.S. policy and the embargo push Cuba to look elsewhere for political and diplomatic aid and direction. The embargo hurts us econo economically, shutting us off from trade and tourism with a neighboring regional economy. You know, there are many Massachusetts businesses, including our state's biotech, medical device, and medical research sectors, or looking to a future when they can bring innovations from Cuba, which has this incredible uh, uh, medical research uh, program but here to the United States. And Cuba has stated that it would welcome Massachusetts business leaders to Cuba to explore such possibilities. These ideas were moving forward thanks to President Obama's loosening of restrictions, which relieved tensions and advanced cooperation between the Cuban and American peoples and private sectors. Sadly, these advances were reversed under President Trump and are currently on hold, I'm sad to say, under the Biden administration. Third, and let me just say this plainly, the embargo is stupid. Let me be clear, I don't agree with the Cuban government on a lot of things. In fact, I have persistent concerns about their human rights record. And I've been vocal about that. There is no question that Cuba is suffering economic hardship and the Cuban government has not delivered on the basic needs of the Cuban people. Their government needs to listen to what their own people are asking for, have a genuine dialogue, and address these needs. But the United States has diplomatic relations with many countries that have awful human rights records. Saudi Arabia, China, Sudan, Egypt, and the list goes on. Our policies towards Cuba are the exception. When we fail to engage, we limit our ability to effectively voice our concerns on areas of disagreement or work cooperatively on areas of mutual concern. And consider this, Cuba is literally the only country in the world where American citizens, my constituents, are prohibited from traveling. I, 
I think the American people are our best ambassadors, yet our own government is telling uh, uh, is telling us that we can't travel to Cuba or only under the most limited restrictions. I don't have to imagine a, a different a policy toward Cuba. We have proof. For over two years during the Obama administration and shortly thereafter, U.S. policy was one of engagement and eliminating restrictions on travel. And most forms uh, of, of partnerships, scientific, educational, environmental, health, and cultural. The result was a thriving and innovative Cuban private sector, expansive cultural and artistic exchange, and advances in environmental and scientific research. In addition, our two governments expanded cooperation in areas of mutual concern and benefit from immigration to law enforcement, counter narcotics, and disaster response. So let me end with this. America's embargo has been a failure. It is a relic from the Cold War, which has long outstayed, outstayed its welcome. The majority of the American people support normalizing relations with Cuba. The majority of Cubans support normalizing relationships, uh, uh, normalizing our relations. The Cold War is over. Our backwards, irrational, and cruel embargo should end too. I realize only Congress can end the embargo once and for all, and that's not probably going to happen uh, really soon. But actions like this important resolution introduced by Councillor Kendra Lara send a strong signal to the nation that it is time to change. It is time to lift the embargo. I thank the committee uh, for inviting me to testify. I thank all those who are testifying here today. Um, we need to move forward and we need to change our policy now. So thank you for your time and for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for your testimony. Uh, I hope to continue our work together on this issue. Next up, we have Tom Kiefer. Is Tom Kiefer with us? Okay, we're gonna move on to Jared Hicks. Is Jared with us? Huang Layton. Huang. Yep, good oh. morning, I'm here. Uh, uh, Councillor um, Lara, thank you for holding this hearing. I, um, my name is Juan Leighton. I'm a resident um, in Rosendale. I've been in Boston for about 33 years. Mm -hmm. uh, long time activist in affordable housing, so I care much about those issues. Uh, I'm here today because I think I, I, I and had act to follow after Congressman uh, McGovern, and I, I would say that, uh, as he was saying, this embargo or blockade is not working. It's just harming the Cuban people. And I had the opportunity to be in Cuba back in June. Um, uh, this was part of like, uh, I went with, um, oh, I, went, I went as part of the uh, Baptist Church, Christian, uh, I'm sorry, with the first Baptist Church of Jamaica Plain to visit one of the sister churches in um, Mayaveque, Cuba. Um, we brought about 200, 000, uh, 200 pounds of like uh, medical supplies. And, and I'm saying this because I think Cuba has the most amazing medical system that has been said here. However, because the blockade, because um, COVID and because they, uh, they failed the chain supply, as we all know, is harming them very deeply. And they don't have access at this point of basic medical supplies, as we do here when you go and get stuff over the counter in any, in any pharmacy. Um, in addition, that's also like causing a lot of sort of like issue with access to food. So I'm giving you that, that picture because I think as they're the most amazing people, at the same time, this, this blockade is causing real, um, real issues among the Cuban people. And, and I think that that's the part that we all have to see. I don't think that the blockade it has to be seen as a political eye at this point. It has to sort of be seen as a humanitarian uh, issue. Mm -hmm. We all have failed and the blockade is a sin. I think at this point, you cannot have something in place for 60 years and just sort of like see how people suffer on a daily basis. Um, I got to see people barely having sort of access to food in the countryside. And again, this is not because, <laughs> it's not because there is, it, it has to do with the blockade. It has to do with like not having access to that. So I, I think I, I'm, I'm here in support of the docket um, 618. And I really sort of like wanna say that I, 
I, I really applaud your like leadership here because I think we all have to stand up at this point and no human being at this point should be having to go through this harm. Um, I, I, I mean, I, we saw like a lot of children and adults like having lack of access to milk and, and, and food, as I said, and, um, and so on and so forth. And, and I like to add that the Cubans are the most resilient people that I ever met in my life. And, and they love people in the US. And, and, and they, when Obama lifted the embargo a bit in a few areas, they really saw like a light and they could really sort of, they, they, they demonstrated that they could do a lot of, um, they could have like an economic um, impact in their life. And people were able to sort of like have some breathing room for some time. So, so I think um, when I think about like uh, what we're doing here, I, I'm really sort of like um, saying that Boston is a national, international leader in many fronts, and now we can take this leadership. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak in here, and I, I think that, um, I think, I hope that this embargo will end. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Layton. Next up, we have Alberto Vasallo III from El Mundo Boston. Alberto. Hi, everybody. Hi, good morning. Yeah, two minutes. Yes, I'm going to try to be just as lengthy as Governor McGovern. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, I represent the Cuban exile community here in Boston. Those who for three generations now have made Boston their home, have opened up businesses, are voters, and are a part of the fabric of the city of Boston, which you, the Boston City Council, represent. And I'm directing myself to the Boston City Council because I think it's important for them to realize the following. And it's very important. With all due respect to all the speakers you've heard here today, there are just as many, if not more, eloquent and, and, and knowledgeable speakers who have the complete exact or the complete opposite opinion. And I think as a civic organization, you have the duty and responsibility to hear the other side. Today's panel has been stacked with those who will tell you one story, and I, as a Cuban-American, son of someone who suffered like four million exiles, have a completely different story, completely different opinion, and a completely different perspective. Now, I don't profess to denounce or go against all of the speakers today. I don't have the time, but I do ask that the council hold this vote and listen to the other side and allow for others with different opinions. If we are truly gonna champion ourselves as a diversity-minded, progressive city, we need to hear all sides of the argument. And with all due respect to the speakers today, there are completely different opinions on this. But in the two minutes that Council Lara is giving me, I just want to remind folks of the following facts about Cuba. The Cuban communist government has consistently violated basic human rights for over 60 years, easily the worst record uh, in the last six years of this hemisphere. Ironically, Cuban exiles have been proudly contributing to this city, and they all come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. As a matter of fact, the resistance to the Cuban government now is being led by young Afro-Latinos on and off the island. And if you need more proof, in your city, the city of Boston today, there is a demonstration going on uh, on um, Atlantic Avenue led by an Afro-Latino young man who is a member of the LaSalle, um, um, uh, the LaSalle um, uh, uh, staff who for one year has been battling uh, and, been and been trying to be the voice of the Cuban-American folks on the island. But here's some, just two more stats for you guys. Um, Cuban exiles, as again, uh, the Cuban government has been, has been globally chronicled and condemned for denying basic human rights. The embargo is not the only reason or even the main reason that the Cuban government, that the Cuban people are suffering. It is that 60-year-old totalitarian government that has not held free elections in over six decades. Ironically, as we come to the end of Pride Month here in the United States, the Cuban Revolution's not so well publicized checkered history with the LGBTQ plus population over the past 60 years includes rounding up gay men and forcing them into regime established prison work camps known as military units to aid production, which is where they deposited all the undesirable elements of Cuban society. That's just one of many examples. So before we go off lauding all the, great all the great things of Cuba that once I will let you see, I, I, I humbly ask that the Boston City Council take into consideration the, the voice of Cuban Americans and Cuban residents who've been here for over 50 years before you make a decision on this, because this is not, and I repeat, 
This is not a one-sided slam dunk. Every speaker you heard here has one side. There are just as many with the other side. So I ask that. That's what I'm asking my city council as a proud Bostonian who was born and raised in this city 54 years ago. Thank you so much, Mr. Rosario, for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Um, next, we have Justin Jimenez. Is Justin Jimenez with us? Hi, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, City Council. Uh, yep. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I'm currently calling in um, from Havana, Cuba, um, where I live and have been working here for the past year and a half, um, you know, as part of the Cuba team for Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective. Um, and, you know, that means that I've been here uh, during the time of COVID, during some of the most difficult moments. Um, you know, I've been here during the protests that happened a year ago. Um, so it's been a pretty historic moment to be here on the ground. Um, and, you know, as someone who's, you know, both a proud Bostonian, born and raised um, from a city that posits itself as a leader in justice and equity and progress on a national and on a global level, um, and as someone who's of Cuban descent, my grandfather was born here and I still have family here, um, you know, I, I, I support this resolution wholeheartedly. Um, you know, I, I have experienced the impact of the sanctions personally. People that I love have. I've seen just how opportunistic the laws that make up the blockade are. Um, you know, going from the laws that were added in the 1990s, speaking about the Torcelli Act, the helms Byrne Law, um, that both made it more difficult for Cuba to buy food and medicine from the U.S. Um, and made the impact of the blockade extraterritorial. Um, to the 243 Trump sanctions that were added, um, you know, during some of the most economically difficult moments here and during the pandemic, um, and which Biden dragged out um, in making changes to until recently, um, are all things that I've seen the way they impact people's lives on a daily basis. Um, I think people have mentioned in terms of being able to access basic medicines. I think people have mentioned the impact that it has on food. Um, and just having to find a third avenue to do everything, you know, from being able to bring money down here um, to hold any kind of relationship with loved ones or business um, or organizing here. Um, and, you know, it's also been an incredibly beautiful moment to be here. Um, you know, I was here during the entire vaccination process from the beginning, seeing how excited people were that their country was developing their own vaccines and doing it separate from the rest of the world and you know, doing something that everybody was in on, um, to just watching my friends get vaccinated, to seeing how dedicated the family doctors were, the team of a doctor and a nurse, um, who each represent about 1,500 patients, um, going around block by block, calling people out by name, making sure that everybody was vaccinated, and how much care people have for each other, and making sure that people are safe, and how that safety is prioritized a lot more than any kind of economic or commercial gain as this is something that we've struggled with in the US, um, you know, as we've uh, rolled back on our COVID policies um, many times too early and many times not taking into account those who are most marginalized um, or those who are in, in the most compromised position health-wise, disability-wise. Um, I've been here uh, during the uh, popular participatory process and rollout of the new family code um, you know, which seeks to, to make space and hold weight for all different kinds of families, all different kinds of partnerships. Um, so these are all things that I've seen and experienced firsthand. Um, again, as someone who's Boston born and raised um, from Hyde Park, from Rosendale, went to Boston schools, um, as someone who is of Cuban descent, um, I represent this wholeheartedly. Um, and, you know, I, I can't say enough about how big it is for a city like Boston uh, to join other cities like Cleveland, like Chicago, um, who've also posited their resolutions and passed them um, as a place that considers itself a beacon of progress and justice uh, to support this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Jimenez. Next up, we have Letitia Pierre-Louis. Is Letitia with us on Zoom? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Ms. Pierre-Louis, you have the floor. 
Thank you for having me. So my name is Atisha Carley. I'm the Health Equity Coordinator at the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing. And I'm also a member of Equity Now and Beyond, a health equity cohort really dedicated to advocating for sort of better um, allocation of health resources to immigrant communities and others. So I've noticed really many barriers um, a lot of immigrant individuals and also other marginalized communities have faced when it comes to accessing health resources. These bar barriers really lead to sort of these large, um, large gaps when it comes to the quality of health for those populations. And implementing um, things like community hubs and having sort of health providers really come meet people, other communities is essential to really ensuring that these needs are met. And from just learning about sort of Cuba's healthcare system, I've come to really admire their really dedication for making the healthcare system a right for everyone, regardless of one's background. And its emphasis on sort of preventative care by addressing sort of one's social determinants of health through sort of health policies is a great lesson that we all can really learn from. So Cubans provide sort of this equitable distribution of health resources, which is a goal that Americans really have yet to achieve. And this U.S. blockade has really prevented people sort of like me who are really interested in sort of making an impactful change in sort of our healthcare system um, from really understanding the way that we can sort of provide sort of these equitable and sort of quality care for everyone. So in addition, sort of these blockade has really prevented Cubans from sort of accessing these key medical supplies needed to, for them to really continue providing these health services to these communities. So that's why I'm here today, really in support of sort of building these stronger relationships um, with Cuban Americans. Thank you once again for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Pierre Luis. Next up, um, we are, have one last person on Zoom. Um, let me do a second call. Do we have Tom Kiefer, Jared Hicks, or Ty DePaz with us? We have one last person on Zoom um, that I think is joining. David. Beautiful. Great. So our last um, Zoom testimony is from David E. Rorlich. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Please correct me. Uh, that's fine. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm, uh, first of all, I thank the City Council for giving this opportunity to testify in support of, uh, of the resolution to stop the embargo of Cuba. I have really just two points to make. One is that this is not a judgment about the government. The speaker, a couple of speakers ago, who said he represented the Cuban American exile community, um, put, the point, put the stress on the nature which he um, the nature of the Cuban government. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that the embargo is absurd. <laughs> Whatever else you can say about Cuba, it is no threat to the United States. And the, the embargo that has been um, imposed is, is just unlike any, any trade dealings that the United States has with much larger countries, more powerful countries countries which could more reasonably be considered to be threatened, countries with nuclear weapons. Only Cuba, or very few other countries besides Cuba, have this embargo imposed on them. And there's no, and it just, it's in the nature of things that, that there's no need for it. Boston has a lot to gain because we're a major and internationally known medical center, and Cuba has done remarkable things in the uh, medical field. We're, we're a city that needs to deal, build climate resilience so that we're not flooded by rising sea, uh, rising sea level. Cuba has a lot of experience with, with um, uh, climate resilience. We're a, we're a city that's known for baseball, Red Sox Nation. Well, Cuba is one of few other countries that actually uh, is interested in baseball. So it makes no sense from, the, from our city's point of view to have this embargo in place. And it makes no sense altogether because we're not making a judgment about the government of Cuba. We're simply saying that the people of Cuba are the ones suffering and they don't need to suffer. Thank you very much. 
thank you so much, um, David, for joining us. I'm glad that we can get you here. At this moment, we are going to move to um, in-person public testimony. Um, has anybody on Zoom joined us, either Tom Kiefer, Jared Hicks, or Ty DePaz? Beautiful. I want to thank all of the folks who testified virtually. Thank you so much for taking time to come and share um, your support and your dissent of this resolution. Um, first up, we have Stephen Rizzo and then Abigail Pomeranz. Right here. Steve, you have the floor and you have two minutes. Can you please introduce yourself for the record? Of course, I'm Steve Rizzo. I'm a Lutheran seminarian and a member of the Boston chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. All, um, today in Havana, in Calixto Garcia Hospital, Cuba's main trauma center, there are 23 operating rooms, but only two have functioning anesthesia machines. All across Cuba, doctors must today reuse examination gloves, because the med not because of any sort of internal shortage, but because the country cannot buy them on the open international market. When the country made a deal with a Swiss firm to buy more anesthesia machines, the company backed down after the chilling effect of US sanctions um, threatened to put financial sanctions on the Swiss company. The United States embargo is a failed policy that most affects the poorest and most precarious people on the island. Madam Chair, honored counselors, today you have heard and you will hear a number of pragmatic reasons for ending the embargo and promoting ties between Boston and Cuba, be they economic, cultural, medical, scientific, or environmental. However, to put it even more simply, this resolution is a question of what is right. It is wrong to punish an entire country's population for 60 years for the sake of a diplomatic dispute between governments. The question that our city today faces is this, whether we will maintain a violent status quo because it is easy, or whether we will do the hard thing because it is right. Will we say, enough is enough, there should be no more division between our peoples? And will we commit to being a city of hospitality to invite Cuban scientists, researchers, academics, doctors, and everyday people to be partners and collaborators in the life of the city of Boston? Passing this resolution in sum is simply the right, the just, and the moral thing to do. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much, Mr. Rizzo, for your testimony. Next up, we have Abigail Pomerantz. Abigail, please introduce yourself for the record, and you have two minutes. Hello, all. My name is Abigail Pomerantz, and I am an intern with Equity Now and Beyond at the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing. First off, I echo what so many others have said here today so eloquently and beautifully. And to add, just to say that the embargo against Cuba is one in a long line of efforts by the United States to control and determine the governments of the global south, especially those of Latin American nations. The roots of the embargo against Cuba are to forcefully reverse the revolutionary sentiment by making life unbearably difficult for the people of Cuba, a policy that undermines the United States' values of freedom and self-determination. The embargo denies the Cuban people and government their ability to develop by preventing or severely impeding the trade of necessary resources and then unjustly and hypocritically blames Cuba for its own woes. Ending the embargo would allow the country to access necessary resources through freer international trade, including incredibly important and accessible trade with the United States. Not only would this trade be mutually beneficial in the exchange of tangible goods, but it would allow the exchange of values, practices, and institutions. For example, as so many others have talked about today, the Cuban healthcare system has what the US largely lacks. It is incredibly robust, free for all, and successfully reaches the many rural corners of the island. 
It also focuses on preventative care, which then functions to curb future health care costs. In the US, health care is remarkably inaccessible, and that leads to massive health disparities along the lines of class, race, nationality, gender, and geographical location, among other factors. Working with Equity Now and Beyond has made the barriers to imperative health care even more clear, especially for immigrant communities here in Boston. Opening the U.S. relationship with Cuba would allow the U.S. to gain inspiration from the Cuban healthcare model, which would greatly benefit massive proportions of our population. Ending the embargo against Cuba would end an antiquated, punitive, and unjust measure that would certainly be mutually beneficial for the Cuban and American people. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Pomeranz. Uh, next, we have Derek Sexton. Mr. Sexton, please introduce yourself for the record. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is Derek Sexton. Um, I live in Somerville, but I work in Boston in the nonprofit sector. In March and April of this year, I went on a delegation to Cuba, 10-day delegation with Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective. Uh, and during that time, I met with all sectors of Cuban society, including popular educators, theologians, organizers, doctors, lawyers, economists, artists, musicians, and historians and medical students, including United States medical students, American students in Cuba. Undoubtedly, there's been advances since the revolution, and two refrains that we heard from the Cuban people were, is that Cuba is not perfect, and that the embargo is their form of collective punishment. Now, the Cuban people display a willingness to admit their problems and also a willingness to solve for them, something that we have to ask about ourselves. Do we do the same? What they value, just like us, is freedom, their families, and they're also going through one of the most difficult periods of their history, just like the 1990s of the special period. Despite all this, they've developed six vaccines against COVID, have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. And the Cuban people, the Cuban people have been moving towards, moving towards greater health for its population. I support this resolution and ending the embargo and the escalating sanctions against Cuba because it affects the Cuban people. It prevents, in my own experience, someone from getting toothpaste down the street or getting over-the-counter medicine like Tylenol when you have a headache, or even prevents a art project for young Afro-Cuban girls from making paper mache because they don't have flour. So I fully support this resolution because the embargo punishes the Cuban people, not the Cuban government. And I also want to say that I think as residents of this area, we have much to learn from the Cuban people. So thank you, Council, and I hope you vote in favor of it. Thank you so much, Mr. Sexton. Next up, we have Nalda Vigezi and following Kevin Whalen. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Can you please introduce yourself for the record? You have two minutes. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much. My name is Nalda Vigezi. I am a Boston resident, although not in either of your districts. Um, but, um, and I've also been an employee working in public sector within the city of Boston for many, many years. Um, I'm also uh, a member of July 26 Coalition, which is one of the oldest Cuba solidarity organizations in the nation, and for 20 years served as a co-chair of the National Network on Cuba, which is the umbrella organization for groups throughout the country doing Cuba solidarity work, recognizing Cuba solidarity. Um, I thank the City Council for taking up this important uh, resolution and in joining cities across, scores of cities across the United States, including our neighbors in um, Brookline and Cambridge, as well as Hartford and most recently New Haven, Connecticut, in passing resolutions. Um, We've heard a lot of learned medical testimony today about the effects of the blockade, um, about the medical, the social, the economic impact, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about how the Cuban um, experience can benefit those of us living in the United States. Um, Cuba has innovative medical health treatments. For instance, in can a cancer treatment, 
They've paired with the Roswell Institute in Buffalo, New York to um, study and advance this treatment. This could be available to my neighbors, your neighbors, here in Boston. They have an innovative um, diabetes treatment. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of, of death and ill health within the United States. We could all benefit from that, including in the United States. Cuba has generously offered medical scholarships to young people, including dozens from the United States who have studied medicine in Cuba at no cost. The only cost is the moral obligation to return to underserved communities and to offer their service. This is certainly something that the communities of Boston could, could benefit from, to see doctors who look like them, who have been trained in communities where they live. Um, so one further point is a cultural aspect, and that is the Hemingway House in the outskirts of Havana. Boston has coupled with, um, with Cuban historians to restore and preserve that. Boston has a long tie with that. So again, there are many opportunities for the city of Boston and for its residents to benefit from this experience. Thank you so much, and um, hopefully this will pass resoundingly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bajazzi. Um Next up, we have Kevin Whalen. Mr. Whalen, please introduce yourself for the record, and you have two minutes. Thank you so much, Councilor Lara, and I'm a very um, honored resident of your district, District 6 in Jamaica Plain. We really appreciate all the leadership you take here in the council. I also, also wanted to thank uh, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson as well, who's been really supportive of our work, um, particularly with the group ACEDON, part of Equity mm -hmm. Now and Beyond. Um, and I wanted to say I have three hats, so I'll try and do this within two minutes quickly. Um, one hat is um, CSIO, where I work, the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing. We coordinate the group Equity Now and Beyond. You've heard from many, uh, many testimonies from Ian and B here today. Um, I would just uh, want to um, emphasize that Equity Now and Beyond is struggling mightily to get the hospitals and the health centers and the health care providers to come to their communities to reach people who do not have access to health care. That will be another hearing we'll hold here at the city council is how to get those hospitals um, to the communities. We work closely with the Boston Public Health Commission to make that happen, but still the efforts have been uh, fruitless lately. And, um, and what, what Cuba does and what the folks from ACEDON and, and Brazilian Women's Group and Haitian Americans United and True Alliance Center and Agencia Alpha, what they recognize in all their countries is that Cuba's medicine is based in the communities. Doctors and nurses, polyclinics that treat people and, and do visits to their homes and the like. That's what we need here. So we have a lot to learn from the Cuban public health system. We want to have that interchange. Um, I'm also a, um, a church council member of First Baptist Church Jamaica Plain. We have a sister church relationship with Church in Mayaveque, Cuba, and, and Juan Leighton and I, uh, Juan spoke earlier, Juan and I brought down 260 pounds of medical supplies three weeks ago, and, and it's quite difficult carrying four 70-pound <laughs> bags at our age, I'll tell you. But they were so necessary to bring down that we took them to our church. The pa uh, Pastor Manolo um, uh, distributed them to the community, not just the church, of course, but goes all out throughout you know, um, schools and health centers and the like and distributes it. And it was so hard to be accompanying him to rural homes. And there was a lot of diarrhea because it's the wet season right now in Cuba. And we had, you know, we had pills to give out that we brought, you know, anti-diarrhea pills, Tylenol and the like. And he had to give like two pills to someone, two pills to an 85-year-old woman and said, this, let's try, see if these will work. And if not, you know, call me tomorrow morning, send me a text tomorrow morning. And I have a 90-year-old mom who suffers a lot of illnesses, and she has the medicine she needs. And that was just heartbreaking to see that there's such a shortage there. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, to introduce, we're going to hear th uh, see three videos now. I'm the last speaker. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's videos from um, a student at the ELAM, at the Escuela Latinoamérica de Medicina. And his name is Antonio Godoy. 
Um, and he, um, he started uh, medical school there for free, he, he says this, um, back in February. He lived with us in JP, he lived in JP, worked at Purple Cactus, was a member of our church, and, um, and through connections with our church, um, we helped him apply and get in. So um, he's testifying from the Elam. Also, Pastor Manolo, who I just described in Mayaveke, um, uh, posted a, a two and a half minute video as well to talk about the impact of the blockade and um, the importance of those medical supplies, as well as Cindy Angler, who's been a public health nurse for 30 years, works a lot in immigrant communities in Boston with the commission and with uh, local health centers as well. So thank you for your time and thank you so much for your leadership on this resolution. This has not happened in 40 years in Boston. There have been attempt after attempt through the leadership of our new city council. And this is an amazing city council now because of your leadership and others. You, you, this, is, this is on the table, so thank you for that. Thank you so much, Mr. Whalen, and thank you so much for all of your work. It is my incredible honor to represent you. Um, we have three people, um, like we're just introduced, who are gonna give us video public testimony. First, we have Antonio Godoy. Get the sound on so we can hear. trying to get the sound up and running so our videos will play very shortly. Thank you for being so patient for everybody who is watching on Zoom and the folks here in the chambers with us. City Council Member of Boston, I'm Antonio Godoy, a First American Sikh at Alam, and for those, 
fue la Latinoamérica de Medicina. Uh, we had a Cuba. I used to live with Alam. Alam is a school in Havana, Cuba. We had a high school student with Ken. Uh, full, on full scholarship, with room and board covered um, for the whole six years with the only in intention and expectation of you returning to your home community to provide medical services in your community. Just a couple of uh, experiences I've, been, I've experienced here from the blockade in real time is the medical shortage of uh, medicine and of certain resources. For example, in the school, uh, a lot of us, my peers, American peers, the Caribbean peers, and kids all over the, all over the world, even the faculty, we're sharing medicine amongst each other just because it's just so hard to get certain medicines, such as antibiotic, Tylenol, um, and, other, and other basic meds. And, and as well, our program that got us here recommends us to just kind of request a three month stockpile, which, just in case you just never know if they're gonna have it or not. Another situation is the, the currency. Once the Biden administration announced the, some of the Trump era restrictions, the economy was very sensitive to, to that announcement. So you were able to see firsthand some of the inflation for some of the local goods, some of the, the, the bank prices for the currency shift. Um, just the, the local street market of simple food, simple, simple vegetables and um, bodega uh, items, prices skyrocket just with the thought of a, a new economy emerging. And lastly is the, the lines, the lines for simple basic items like toothpaste, um, soap, hand sanitizer, toilet paper. It's usually a long line that ranges from 30 minutes to a couple hours just because there's always a shortage of items here due to the blockade. So these items that we take very, very loosely in the United States, it, it's a difficult task and always a, a four day adventure trying to ret retrieve those items. And just for those reasons, me, me and my peers, the American peers and other students here are against the blockade and continuously against the blockade and urge the Boston Council to push this resolution. Thank you. And next up we have um, a video testimony from Pastor Mano. Buenas noches a los integrantes del Consejo de la Ciudad de Boston y a la Primera Iglesia Bautista de Jamaica Plains en Boston. Permítame presentarme. Soy el reverendo Manuel Delgado que me desempeño como pastor en la Iglesia Bautista Comunidad Cristiana Emanuel en San José de las Lajas, provincia de Mayabeque. También represento al Consejo de Iglesias de Cuba en la provincia de Mayabeque. Desde diciembre del año 2019, la First Baptist Church of Jamaica Plains, radicada en un barrio de Boston y nuestra iglesia, Comunidad Cristiana Emanuel, hemos comenzado una relación de amor en Jesucristo. Uno de los temas recurrentes en los encuentros tenidos ha sido el bloqueo por parte de los Estados Unidos a Cuba. Quiero agradecer al Consejo de Boston y a las personas que han trabajado en el intento de tener un acuerdo en contra del bloqueo a Cuba. Este bloqueo sexagenario ha sido particularmente impactante durante la situación de pandemia por COVID-19 sufrida desde el 2020 hasta el presente año. La iglesia en Jamaica Plains se ha mostrado muy solidaria con nosotros en cuanto a la situación crítica que padecemos con los medicamentos por causa de no poder recibir en nuestro país por el bloqueo las maderas primas para la fabricación de medicamentos o estos ya elaborados. Recientemente, los hermanos de esta comunidad cristiana nos han entregado como donación cerca de 200 libras de medicamentos, jeringuillas, pruebas rápidas de antígeno para COVID-19, equipos para tomar presión arterial, materiales de curación, vitaminas, también leche en polvo para ancianos que desayunan en nuestro templo y otros materiales. Agradecemos a estos hermanos a otras iglesias hermanas y también a personas individuales en Estados Unidos y otros países las donaciones recibidas y estamos en disposición de seguir contribuyendo a la distribución de las donaciones como hasta ahora. Estas las hemos hecho llegar no solamente a personas de la iglesia, sino a muchas personas que no...
ancianos, escuelas de educación especial, policlínicos, médicos y a todos los que hemos tenido la posibilidad. I think that that was the end um, of the pastor's testimony. And next up, we have a video testimony from Cindy Engler. Hello, my name is Cindy Engler, and I'm a resident of Roslindale. I've worked in public health in Boston and in Boston community health centers and hospitals for over 30 years. I'm here to support the resolution to end the U.S. embargo against Cuba and opening up of new travel and collaborative cultural, medical, and academic opportunities. Cuba has been under the U.S. blockade, which has been condemned annually by the U.N. General Assembly by nearly unanimous votes for over 60 years, with the original goal to bring hunger and desperation among the people of Cuba. Cuba suffers stronger sanctions than any other country, although it's no threat to the United States. The cushion that every other country has at time of crisis, particularly in this time of COVID, a global pandemic which affects us all, isn't available to Cuba because of these sanctions and the US fines and banks and businesses. This embargo harms the people of Cuba. Cubans are denied access to technology, medicine, affordable food, and other goods that could be available to them if the United States lifted the embargo. The past two years more than ever, during a global pandemic, the embargo prevents the import of medical supplies and equipment. No one believes the embargo is working, and we have so much to gain if instead of starving our Cuban neighbors, we collaborate with Cuba in public health strategies, community health measures, development of new medications and new treatment protocols. The time is right. Thank you for your work and for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you all so much. Uh, at this moment, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, do you have any closing remarks that you would like to share? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Pastor Kiki, for being here. Uh, I think most of my questions um, throughout listening was about implementation. I guess I look forward to that post this resolution being passed, uh, God willing. I'd like to thank the um, public testimonies today. Uh, wonderful work, wonderful research. I thank you for your heart and courage um, and compassion for on this issue. Um, it's interesting that uh, Alberto made a good point. Um, and first, I'd like to shout out, uh, what is it, Rep uh, McGovern mm -hmm. um, for, for using, uh, quoting me. I always say, this is stupid. Um, in the chamber, and certainly this embargo is stupid. Um, I agree, uh, Rep. McGovern. And as far as uh, for Albert, um, I deeply um, understand um, the, your concern, and uh, although we're not here specifically to alienate or demonize an entire country based on um, certain failed policies, my uncle who raised me uh, was a gay man who married a Cuban citizen, and it was extremely difficult to get him out of Cuba to get married and then to live their lives in the Netherlands um, later on before he passed. Um, and so I, I, I deeply uh, understand, I remember speaking with my uncle around the issues and the oppression that he and his husband had to face at the time. Um, again, uh, we are, we're not in the business of demonizing or generalizing an entire country based on failed policies. Um, and certainly those who are most vulnerable shouldn't suffer based on um, imperfections. I don't think that even this nation is perfect. And I think that also it, it lends to um, the ideology of colonialism. It's almost sort of like the new Jim Crow of Cuba. Um, how do we continue to colonize a, a place? And if, we're, if we can't, if we're not successful, uh, then we will deny them access and resources and make sure that they suffer because we can't take anything from them. Um, I look forward to hearing more about this. Again, thank you so much for having the insight um, and of course the passion to filing this and uh, look forward to hearing from you all and your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. I want to say thank you to all of the panelists that join us today and to all of the members and our constituents um, who came to testify um, 
in regards to this docket. Um, we had a couple of people who gave us testimony all the way from Cuba, and we're incredibly grateful for your time and the effort um, to have your voice here heard on the city council. Um, a special um, show of gratitude for my constituents and the churches and the community organizations in District 6 who have, and all across the city, who have been in incredible solidarity with the Cuban people uh, and made sure that this was on our office's radar and supported us to make sure that we got this done. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, as somebody who came up in the black internationalist tradition, I know that my well-being and my liberation is directly tied to that of all of oppressed people globally. And my hope is that this resolution, when it is voted on on Wednesday by the Boston City Council, will be a small ripple in what is the massive ocean um, of a movement across the country to end the embargo on Cuba. So thank you all, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>